This is a main hustle media podcast. Mix, the podcast about race and identity from the mixed race perspective. I am your host, Charmaine, aka Mixed Girl Maine. And here we go, week nine. Um, I, I'm so excited that the show is working and connecting to people. I've gotten some really great messages from people this week about some of the interviews that they've heard so far. And I mean, that is so much more than I expected to get. Like, I hoped that the show would take off. I mean, I still do. I hope that this show becomes a top 10 iTunes fucking podcast. I do. Uh, But uh, what's more important is that it's a show that represents us as mixed race people. And even though it is my show, I... I get to be a fan because I get to listen back to these discussions that I've had with folks when I'm editing an episode to present to you the next week. And I get to remember what it feels like to feel normal for those few hours that I talk to somebody where we get to talk about our shared experiences about being mixed and where we get to, you know, joke about some of the fucked up things that have happened to us or, you know, commiserate about it or whatever. Like, oh, this show just gives me so much life. And I know I say it every week, but it just it gets better every week. Like every week I get to talk to somebody else. And every week it tells me that this is the right path, that we need this. I need this. And from the messages that y'all are sending me, it's obvious that you guys need it too. So thank you so much for those of you who are reaching out to me. Um, Just know that when you do, I'm going to try to get you to come on the show. But if you don't want to get on the show, you don't have to. But still send me those messages because there are a few people even right now who aren't willing to come on the show, but I have connected to the show and they've been emailing me or, or messaging me through one of the social media platforms. And we're just engaging. We're just talking about our mixed ass lives. And that shit is amazing because we don't get to do it that often. And so I'm really appreciative of everybody who's willing to do that with me. And trust me that I'm going to protect and care for your stories because I am. But you don't know that. (laughs) Like you don't know me. So you don't know that I'm going to do that. And so I'm appreciating that you are, you know, giving me that. Um, I'm not going to share anything that I'm not being asked to share. And um, if you don't want to come on the show, besides me just sort of referencing, you know, vaguely like I am now, you know, you'll never hear about it publicly. Um, But I want to hear stories. I want you to tell your stories to the world. I think everybody needs to hear it. So, um, so yes, I don't care how small you think your story is. I guarantee you it's going to impact somebody. I guarantee you because a lot of the times the comments that I'm getting are about some of the small moments that people mention on the show. If your story is huge and you think it's too much, we'll split that shit into two episodes. I don't care. Like your stories are important at however traumatic or however non-traumatic or however just general. I've got an episode coming up where this one person, he's like, no strife, no drama. He just has a, he he got to feel normal most of the time. And that's not a a perspective of mixedness I've ever heard before. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you as well. All of our stories are significant. All of our stories are important. So please, if you're even remotely interested in and engaging, come and tell me your stories. Whether you want to come on the show or not, reach out to me because it's the reason why I'm doing this. I need to know that what I'm doing is resonating with you. And if it's not, I need to know how to fix it so that it does make you feel represented and seen because that is the major goal of this show. So yeah, I think that's enough gushing probably. Um, It was just important. I I got some really, really good messages this week. And I just like kind of riding the high of knowing that the show is connecting with people and it's motivating. You know, it almost makes me like regret that I'm only doing one episode a week, but I literally cannot afford this the the time to be able to produce more than one episode a week uh, because I've got three other podcasts that I'm working on. And more than that, you probably can only stomach one episode a week. So, Um, but I got some good stuff coming. I've got about 10 interviews banked. I've got about seven more on the docket. So, you know, we're not slowing down. I'm talking to people every week. You're going to get some good stories out there. And um, as the show develops and as the show progresses, as we get a little bit more popular, get a little bit more sponsorship, uh, it'll afford us the opportunities to share more content with you um, on a regular basis. And that being said, as I've mentioned before, we are a fan sponsored podcast. And I am happy to announce that this week we got another sponsor on Patreon. And I guess this is kind of a cross story because this is also somebody who reached out to me on, on Twitter. She had discovered the show and 
then it, you know, it impacted her. We engaged back and forth in a couple of messages. And then, you know, I'm just driving down the street, uh, running some errands and I get a little ping on my phone that told me that we got another Patreon sponsor and it turned out to be her. So I just want to give a shout out to Emma and I hope I say your last name right. Showin' makers. Uh, I, at the level that you are sponsoring, it'll, it will really help the show. I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for your participation in that way. Um, and for the conversations that we've sort of had back and forth via email so far, it just means so much to me that you're willing to share with me and with the, and, and, sponsor the show to continue to share our stories with other people so with the audience so thank you so much and if you are also inclined listeners um, to sponsor the show if the show is giving you life the way it's giving me life you can go to patreon www.patreon.com slash militantly mix and you can sponsor us for as low as one dollar a month to as high as you wish there are different reward levels depending on what you want to uh, give at and right now I have the buttons and a couple of t-shirts and things like that i'll have more swag with time you know as we start to uh, get a little bit more sponsorship we'll we'll have a little bit more flexibility with that um and get more content up on there for you but that's a good place to start and if you just want to give a one-time only donation that is super helpful as well and we are finally up on paypal uh you can go to paypal dot me slash militantly mix and drop us a donation for us there all of the money that comes to the show goes directly into uh, hosting fees improving equipment and with time and if we get a lot more sponsorship we'll be able to actually uh, hire someone to do the engineering because at this point it's me and as you've heard in some of the episodes sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad part of that had to do with older episode or over o- older interviews where I didn't have equipment yet, which is an example of what you're going to hear today. And some of the ones, the equipment is better, but there's still some things here and there. I do live in an apartment complex. It is loud. Sometimes you hear stuff in the background, yada, yada. Um, but with time, we'll get there. With time and with sponsorship, we will get there. For now, let's just switch over to the episode. This week, I get to speak to Dana Sato. She is a half Japanese, half white teacher, high school teacher in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Uh, so she and I have a lot of crossover in, ter- in terms of our cultural upbringing when I was with my mom's side of the family. Uh, so we had some shared experiences there. Uh, but we get into a lot of good stuff. We, we get into um, the the difference in in uh, demographics between teachers and students and how a lot of times the teachers uh, aren't reflective of the student body. And so there's that disconnect on how, you know, how are you educating children of color when you are not, et cetera, things like that. So we get into equity in the school system. We also talk about that terribly racist concept that people seem to think is allyship called colorblindness, which I know I've talked about a little bit on the show, but not enough. Uh, probably we'll have to get really into it pretty heavily soon uh, because colorblindness is just something that irks me so much. It's such an erasing type of allyship. And I say allyship with my quotation fingers. Um, So we get into that as well in this episode. We talk about that ugly dynamic of when a white woman has children of color that people think she, they've they've adopted those children. And when a woman of color is with children that appear white, they think that they're a nanny. So we get into that, too. So some good stuff on this episode. So if you can look past uh, the fact that there is kind of a weird loudness and sort of the background of this episode, the what we the content of what we talk about is very important in terms of mixed races and uh, people of color uh, in the school system in general. Um, she has a really interesting experiment she conducted with teachers with where race is concerned. So I enjoyed myself on this talk and I hope to talk to her again later on in the school year as we can see how her program progresses in terms of the equity across the student body so or the student teachers. So yeah, so let's get into it. Without further ado, here is my discussion with Dana Sato. And today I'm joined with Dana Sato, and I will let her give you a little introduction about herself, and then we'll get into it. Um, hi, I'm uh, I'm Dana Sato. Um, thanks for having me. First, uh, um, I, joining me. Yeah, I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk about this stuff. So my ethnic background is I'm half Japanese, half white. Um, my dad is third generation Japanese American. Um, my 
great grandparents actually came over in the 1920s hmm. and my mom's side is some mishmash of, of white uh, there's some rumors that they came over with the Mennonites in like the 1600s we're not entirely clear on what that is um, and I'm a public high school teacher in uh, in the Washington DC area all right um, so we we got connected through one of the Facebook Japanese Americans groups, correct? Yes. Yeah. That's that's where I first saw your post about militantly mixed. And I was like, I need to get in on that. Right? <laughs> I have a lot to say. <laughs> that's so. awesome. Well, yeah. So, so far, um, and it could be a little bit because my, my identity is a little bit um, pro-black, even though I am black and Japanese and white, I, I tend to identify in sort of a um, cultural hierarchy is sort of, I, I was more immersed around black culture and then Japanese culture in my in my grandma's house and then white I was never really I couldn't say that I was ever really immersed in it but I think of myself as like black and Japanese uh, more culturally and, and sort of ethnically but I never deny the rest of my ethnicity even even for what I don't um, have much interaction with but I love that Japanese American group that we're on because uh, there's there's a ton of mixed people on there we there's yeah. you know there, there are a lot of monoracial folks but there's a ton of mixed race people on there and I love getting to see that there are some of us out there that it's just like we don't get, we don't fall into the trap on the Japanese side, at least for me, where you have to be one or the other. Um, mm-hmm. you, you know, you just get to be mixed and, and you get to say, well, like, well, from my perspective on the Japanese side, blah, blah, blah. But on the white side, blah, blah, blah. So right. that, that group is really interesting for that. And when we talked a little bit before, we talked about, so for me, my militancy in terms of race is talking about racial issues to, to try to open, I guess, kind of like open white people's minds up to the fact that we do actually have a different existence than them, even though we live in the same country and we are affected and impacted by things. And so as a result of that, I tend to get a little, you know, ah, militant about it. Um, but also I have the, the, the thing about just wanting to be visible, like as a mixed race person that you look at me and you're like, oh, you're mixed and I don't have to hear, um, but where are you from or no, where are you really from and all that kind of stuff. So that, right. that sort of gets my militancy up. Um, and when I've been speaking to people, it's been a mixed reaction to people who sort of understand what I mean when I say militantly mixed versus just talk, having a podcast about mixed raceness. And in mm-hmm. your case, I felt like in our initial discussion, your militancy is about educating educators right. on this kind of stuff. So let's get into that a little bit. Well, so a lot of that for me comes from the fact that I see so many students of mine walk in my classroom that aren't represented in our staff or aren't represented in our literature that we teach or their history is not taught in social studies classes. And so a lot of that for me comes from a lot of that comes from trying to help you know my colleagues come up with other things to talk about or um, you know other subjects to broach or for um, even for kids just to find a place where they're comfortable. Right. Um, yeah. You know I, I, I think I told you about this last time but you know I, I have this core group of half Japanese half white boys boys that eat lunch in my room every single day and they have yeah. since freshman year for no other reason than because we feel connected by yeah, that one right. thing that we share that we look like each other we have similar customs we have similar habits you know and it just it helped I mean even even me as as the adult in the room but mm. it, it helps all of us just feel seen right um, and so a lot of my passion for this comes from helping my students because a lot of times growing up as a student I didn't feel seen so. Yeah, when you first told me about that, I was like, I, I thought that was great that you provide that for them. And then it's probably not even something that you discuss, right? It, they're just, no. they just come there and, and you're just a presence for them. And it's it's just your own realization that they needed some sort of representation. And just by sitting next to you, they kind of get, they, they get vi- seen that way. And that right. that's an awesome thing to do. So uh, you had told me when we first initially talked that the demographic of your, of your teachers are like 85 or 90 percent white and then the rest is sort of you know a little bit uh like you could actually number how many asians and how many black people yep. and mixed with people there are um and but that your school population did you say it's like 40 percent hispanic yeah, or something like that you want to talk about that a little yeah yeah our um our popular our student population is a little over 40 percent hispanic um i think we're at, for this incoming school year i think we're at 25 to 30 percent black and then the next largest racial group is white and then the asians and then the mixed race kids. Um, 
actually, interestingly, um, our school system only started recognizing multiracial students in like the last three years. Like we just started seeing that demographic pop up. Oh, really? On, yeah. And, and it, it was funny to me because I said something at a staff meeting. They were like, oh, why does it matter? I was like, because we matter. <laughs> right. And, no, like, you know, it, it, it's not fair for these kids who identify with multiple things to just be brushed off and be like, oh, choose one. Mm. You know, because I was told that as a kid, like when you have to bubble those things, are you Asian? Are you black? Are you right. white? Are you Hispanic? And I remember I had a teacher who said, well, which one are you more? And I was like, literally, I'm literally half. Literally half. <laughs> like, <laughs> what part what of half do do? doesn't make sense? Yeah. yeah, I had the same the same thing. It was during one of the school, like the standardized state tests. And the thing came up that said, check your ethnicity. And it said, check only one. So I walked up to the teacher and who was not my normal teacher. It was like a proxy, I guess. Yeah. And I said, I don't know what to pick because I'm, I'm mixed race. And, and she looked at me she looked at me and she said same thing like what are you the most and I'm like well I'm I'm you know my dad's black and white my mom's Japanese and white but I don't know any white people in my family and she she said well if you're smart you'll pick white because you'll go further in life oh. and I was I was a freshman in high school and I was sitting here thinking but they're gonna see me eventually and they're gonna yeah. know that I'm not white so me yep. checking a box that says white isn't going to improve my life or my status in any way and that was one of those markers you know there's a few things that I can kind of look back on into my childhood and young adulthood where I was like, oh, that's when I started feeling about blah, blah, blah. And that's when I started, you know, saying, no, I don't have to tell you what I'm mixed with or, you know, things like that. And that was one right. of my early markers as kind of my waking up to being, you know, how important it was to be seen as a mixed race person. Right. I, I didn't realize that they were actually accounting for that in any school districts. But um, but I guess it's even though it's way late in the game, it's nice to know that they are. Um, do they struggle yeah. with determining what it means? Like, are they trying to separate? even the mixed race groups where it's like are you mixed with this and this are you biracial are you multiracial or is it a, just a flat no number? it's just it's just a flat these are our students who identify as multiracial um mm. you know, it, it's not separated by half black half white half asian half black half black half hispanic like it's it's just a flat out multiracial kids right That's but a, it's a weird thing because you want to kind of know you want your teacher demographic to rep to be representative of your student base but, mm -hmm. but at the same time as a mixed race person i kind of wish we didn't collect this type of information uh, yeah you know so it's this it's this weird sort of thing how how does how does the discrepancy between your um, teacher demographic versus your student demographic, how, what's that like for you as a teacher? Well, I mean, you know, for, from my perspective, it's it's a little weird in that there are some times when I feel like I have an obligation to speak up, that I have mm -hmm. a perspective that other teachers and other staff members don't have because I'm Asian or because I'm multiracial and I know that the majority of my colleagues are not. Um, so I, in some ways, I feel a little bit of pressure that way that like I it's right. it's my responsibility to speak up. But um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably the best way to put it is if I'm not going to speak up for these multiracial kids, then who in this staff is. Right. And at least you have evidence that you, just your presence alone has an impact on at least a handful of kids, probably more than you actually get to see on a regular basis. But um, l allowing that to play out in your committee meetings or things like that further, it's it, it's an unfortunate side effect of the position that you have you don't you shouldn't have to do it but right if you don't yeah that's that's something that i kind of struggle with thinking of too um well yeah let's let's talk a little bit about what it, what does it mean for you to be a voice for these for these mixed race kids or even just the asian population well i i I got the impression that you actually speak up on behalf of all of the sort of non-Caucasian kids because of that lack of voice. Is that, is well, that kind of accurate? I, to, to a certain extent. So I, what you were saying about you, uh, you have a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Sort of how you, like, I completely resonate with that because, you know, I was raised with mostly my Japanese relatives. So I identify a lot more closely with my Japanese side than I do with my white side. So even though I am 50-50, like there is kind of a hierarchy for me because mm -hmm. of, you know, what I was raised with who I know things like that but at the same time I present Latina to most people right <laughs> um, <laughs> <Don't> we all <laughs> yeah so so like the only people who ever ever see me as mixed are other mixed Asian white people yeah um so a lot of like a lot of times growing up I had this thing of like well 
there are some specific situations where I can be white passing. And then there are some mm. very specific situations where people will see me as my mix. And then most people are going to see me as Latina. Mm. So I get some of that too. And then like when they try to speak to me in Spanish and I can't answer back, yeah. <laughs> then I'm like, I'm sorry. And I, don't, I, I was actually at a Japanese market a few weeks ago and someone like I was literally speaking Japanese to the person like about the fish that I was trying to buy. Mm. And someone else came up to me and started trying to speak Spanish to me. I was like, do you what? not <laughs> do you not see what's <laughs> happening here? But um, and then like started saying I'm like well why don't you speak Spanish so I'm like because I'm not <laughs> but um, it's so funny. but because of that um, I you know I don't want to say that I know what it's like to be Latina because I don't sure but I do know what it's like to be treated as though I were brown right because that's how I've been treated a majority of my life so you know I, I do feel like I need to speak up for all all of my students, but I feel like I have a stronger voice for my Asian and mixed students, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. No, yeah, it does. I mean, because I think of it like I, I get the same thing where I get spoke Spanish to quite a bit. And, and then I, when I say I don't speak Spanish, I, I have to go through that whole conversation. Well, why don't you speak Spanish? Well, because I'm I'm not Latinx or, you know, or that's like, well, aren't you proud of looking this way? It's like, but I, I mean, I just because I look a certain way doesn't mean that I would have right. cultural pride in that direction. That happened to me a lot when I was growing up as a kid in Long Beach, it was like, aren't you proud to look Mexican? I'm like, I mean, ah, I don't yeah. know what that even would be, being proud of this of this thing um, that other people do. But I feel like, at least if anything, you have the empathy, understanding that these these kids are being othered by right. the majority population, and, and therefore you're you're a voice in that. Um, I really, I mean, I, I I wish I had known besides people that I was related to, other Japanese mixed Japanese, um, you know, just so that you felt like a little bit similar to some. Somebody. I tended to right. gravitate more towards the black kids because I grew up in black neighborhoods and everything like that. And they were very warm and accepting of me as a as a black kid. So I go I go through my phase of like, I just want to be black. I, I just wish I looked blacker so that I could I didn't have to tell people I'm black all the time. And then when I'm around Japanese people, I I get nervous because I have a mixed bag of like my Japanese family. We 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 held back that we were black from them. You know, only my mm -hmm. only my grandmother knew for the longest. And so, um, you know, there's that period of time of like when I'm around Japanese people it, the instinct in kicks in to, to sort of not reveal it and then I and then I remember I'm like oh that was when I was a kid I don't have to do that anymore you know and and then I can kind of come out I guess <laughs> right as a black and Japanese and I went to an event a couple weekends ago at the the Japanese American National Museum here in LA and it was about uh, the war bride era the Japanese war bride era bringing those those wives here to the states and the different the different uh, eras within that whole time from World War II to the end of the Korean War. And the, there were a few other black Japanese mixes there. And it was the first time, and it's not like I haven't seen them on occasion, but it was the first time in a long time when I just saw people that looked kind of like me legitimately, not just like, oh, you kind of look black or you kind of look like this or something like that. It was like, oh my gosh, I can see similarities in our in our facial structures and like our coloring right. and everything. And it felt so awesome. And then one of the, one of the guys, which I think I mentioned on, a, on another thing is like one of the guys looks at me from across the room we're getting an introduced and he gives me the Wakanda forever arm signal and I give it back because it was like that was like we were both black Japanese and in that moment we saw each other and it was a you know like I rode the high off of that moment for like <laughs> yeah, the last two weeks because it's so rare to feel normal. Uh, normal is the wrong word. Um, it's so rare to not be seen as different, I guess, from right. the mass, the majority of the people that are in the room. And that doesn't matter whether they're for me, whether they're black or Asian or white or Latin or whatever. I'm always different from all of them because I'm multiracial, you know. Right. Um, you talked a little bit when we when we first talked about how you took Russian and French in school. Was there was there some sort of did we did we have a thing a similar thing where we both protested and kind of didn't take <laughs> yeah. Spanish because people thought we were Spanish? Yep, <laughs> so. yep. that's exactly why I took French <laughs> in high school. Uh, yeah, I mean, because I grew up in Southern California too, and you know, with a last name like Sato, right? You know, everyone likes to change it to Soto and or Santos or something, right? Yeah, that's not my last name. And so yeah, when it came to time to choose a foreign language, I was like, not taking Spanish. <laughs> I'm not gonna add to this idea anymore. So I signed up for French and away we went. <laughs> yeah, I did the same thing. I, it's so it's so funny too, because you just, you know, now that I still live down here and I so often have to in, in, interact with people who are um, 
almost exclusive Spanish speakers. I'm like, man, I wish I did speak it. But at the same time, I don't ever want to be busted speaking it because then there's going to be this extra expectation. Yeah, I have. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I feel the exact same thing because, you know, so much of my school population is Latino. Mm. I'm like, I, I really want to be able to communicate with you. But there's this thing in the back of my head that says I, I don't want everybody to start assuming that I'm Latina again. Mm. But yeah. So as as a teacher, what are the kind of points of frustration? Are there things that you just see that you, you know, you have to be like, oh, now this is something I got to deal with? Or or do you or do you just are things happening on like at the school level that you feel <laughs> like you need end up having to insert yourself in? Well, so I'm, I'm actually really proud of my county in terms of with the high schools that we have right now. There is an initiative to have what they're calling an equity team, um, mm-hmm. where our entire job is to look at how our students are performing by race and are there factors that have nothing to do with the classroom, but maybe everything to do with culture, representation that we can do to help them. Um, and so this nice. this past spring, I was named head of my high school's equity team. Um, and I've been spending the summer so far this year trying to figure out how to tell my 90% white staff how to deal with white privilege. <laughs> right. Um, because I think, you know, it's something that we, we have to deal with. Um, and I don't think we're going to help our students if we continue to put our heads in the sand about this kind of thing. Um, so my, my big tackling things at the very beginning in September, and I'm sure I'm going to be everybody's favorite staff member, is talking about <laughs> <laughs> talking about white privilege and um, and colorblindness. Mm-hmm. Um, because yeah, I, color I <laughs> yeah, because I see it a lot in in very well meaning teachers, very well meaning staff members, but I just I don't think they've had the appropriate um, exposure to right, what it exactly. is, and they don't know how to necessarily check their privilege and how what they're saying might affect a student and therefore mm-hmm. that there goes that kid's motivation. Right. That is a point of real frustration and I'm glad that you brought up colorblindness because we haven't really dealt with it on any of the episodes quite yet and it's it's that allyship that is well-meaning but yep. I, in my own experience I feel that it tends to be the allies that say some of the most messed up things you know yeah. completely coming from a good space but because they have privilege and because they haven't had to deal with life the way people of color do, they just are just completely ignorant of how terrible some of the things that they do and say are. And something like, I choose not to see you as fill in the blank race or right. I, I I don't see color. I see, I just see a human that that yep. erases us because you get to walk around being the standard. When someone says human, we're popping into our head a white person because our, our, our culture, our pop culture, like everything tells us white person, white person, white person. We even have to call all of us that aren't white people of color. So right. <laughs> so things like that can be so frustrating. And to try to be like, look, I know you're well-intentioned and I don't want to lose your vote. <laughs> you right. know, I don't want to lose your allyship. But here, let me tell you all the ways in which you're wrong. How do you do yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's the trick, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I actually had a conversation with um, with one of our staff members right before we left because, um, you know, they had just announced about our equity team and all that. And, and she and I were talking and, um, and she's like, well, she's like, it's interesting to me because I just see you as a teacher who loves literature and you're a theater teacher and you love swimming. And that's who you are to me. And I was like, OK, but you just erased so much <laughs> of what I identify as. And I yeah. said this to her face. I was like, you know, like my Japanese culture is so important to me. Like, it's important mm-hmm. to me that on July 7th, we celebrate Tanabata. It's important to right. me that we, that, you know, my kids have yukata to wear on Children's Day. It's important to me that we do things for Japanese New Year. Mm. And when you tell me that you don't see that, you, you've you erased half of me. Right. <laughs> like, I, 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 and she she just looked at me like I'd grown a third head. And I was like, I, I don't know how else to explain it to you. Yeah. But you don't get to decide what I identify as. Exactly. And oh gosh, and I don't understand why people believe that type of a statement to be friendly. Um, but I, the, the only thing I could chalk it up to is that your privilege allows you to never feel different 
And therefore, you don't ever have to worry about right. what we have to worry about. And, right. you know, that's the moment where you see someone's eyes glaze over and you're just like, I've lost them. And there's really there's really not a good way besides putting someone in a place where they are an other. There's really no good way mm-hmm. to expose people to that. And who knows what they react, how they're going to actually react to being othered, you yep. know, what direction that's even going to take. And I've been, I've been trying to do research on it. And I know there's a little bit out there, but there's there's not really I mean, what someone's going to put a YouTube tutorial on how to talk to someone about their privilege <laughs> and, <laughs> right, and, right. and you know and get them to really get it and understand so what do you think are some of the things like are you are you kind of trying to work that out during the summer break like what are the kind of things that you besides stopping a person in their tracks in the moment that they use their privilege accidentally against you uh, if you want to say it like that are you wor- working ways out besides besides just hitting them with it are there other tools and methods that you're going to try to yeah, <laughs> come so up with one of my big concerns is is people are just going to file into a staff meeting and they're just going to be like, oh, we're here for another staff meeting. Let's just get through it. Right. Um, so have, have you ever done the um, the Petri dish exercise? Uh, it, explain it. Uh, so it's like everybody gets a Petri dish and there's a bunch of like different colored beads and like the and it, 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 it comes off kind of racist, but like the white <laughs> beads represent white people. The yellow mm-hmm. beads represent Asian people. The purple beads are multiracial people, black beads, black people, etc. And, um, okay. and so like you just ask everybody like, like, okay, so um, put your dentist in. And then if your dentist is Asian, you put in a yellow bead. If your mm. dentist is white or and so on and so forth, and like you go through like your neighbors, your closest colleagues, your best friend, your family, things like that. Mm-hmm. And then you look at and you do this in small groups, like four to six people. Mm-hmm. And then you look at each other's Petri dishes and try to like understand who you surround yourself with and are you surrounding yourself with other people like yourself which most people do mm. and it's, it's just kind of really eye-opening for a lot of people to be like oh I've never been in a situation where I'm othered mm. but that person is maybe I need to listen to that person that's um, interesting does it stand out a lot to to the well, okay, I'm just going to make an assumption based yeah. off of how some of some of my life and other others around me have been. So let let's say it's a person of color who only sees white doctors or white dentists and things like that, mm-hmm. you know, grocery store workers, stuff like that, because they have to travel outside of their neighborhoods. Is it eye opening to the white kids that the, the the POC kids might have a dish with more white beads in it than whereas like their dishes would look more white with a couple of color beads in there? Well, so I've never done this with kids. I've only done this with adults. Oh, okay. Um, um, but you know, the the last time I did it with um, with some colleagues, you know, it, it was so our um, our leadership team is approximately I would say like twenty five to thirty people, and um, you know, it's twenty of twenty five of them are white, and there are five of us who are people of color, um, <laughs> and uh, the the majority of the white people had majority white beads with the occasional yellow or black or or purple bead, mm-hmm. and um, and the one black woman in our group had predominantly black and white beads. Um, and then the other multiracial person in the room and I, our, our, our Petri dishes were the only ones that were like, yeah, I'm just going to throw the whole thing in. Yeah. Um, and, and we kind of spoke to that a little bit is that, you know, people who are multiracial just by nature of who we are, just, like just by nature of our families, right. yeah. you know, are going to have these different experiences. And I, and one of the points that I was trying to make to them is, you know, you have to expand your horizons. You have have to talk to other people and mm-hmm. if you keep staying in this bubble of the same color beads you're never going to move from where you are right and I think sometimes seeing that like literally in their face helps a lot. Right. And then you can start taking the next step of, OK, now how do we address this? How do we talk to each other about this? Mm-hmm. That's a weird thing about about the way empathy works is that on the on the face of it, you think that you put yourself in a position and therefore you can see why something is right or wrong or blah, blah, blah. But we're seeing that that's not really the case because you right now we're we're locking children up in cages and separating them Ugh. from their parents at the border and people are still saying, well, their parents shouldn't be committing crimes coming into the states illegally. Whereas we know that if we actually started to just pick up random, you know, American white children and putting them, you know, behind cages and separating from them from their families and and, and for any arbitrary reason, you know. Right. Because 
you know, there could be a number of things that that they could get locked up for. Um, then all of a sudden it would be like, oh, well, we can't be wa- locking up these kids, you know? <laughs> right. So, and so the fact that, that just being a human isn't enough to, to give you empathy and see that some, the, the way you surround yourself or the, how you treat people or whatever, it's not enough that you actually need to see something so simple as beads in a Petri dish or, um, or actually get your own kids taken away if we're going to go that right, you know, if we're going to go for the, right. for the hard story. Like, it's, uh, I, I can't think. I mean, it must be, but I can't believe that it's just on the grounds that I'm mixed race that I can see with without having to worry about what color the skin is of the person in this scenario, that I'm just seeing that this thing is right or this thing is wrong or this thing is inclusive and this thing isn't. Right. It can't be just because we're mixed race that we see it this way. But then you get it like like you said, you, you got these people that are saying your dishes are more are more mixed up in color than theirs. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, really? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think it's kind of human nature that you want to gravitate towards people like you. you know, um, right. And I think for, for multiracial people, that's harder to do. That could be anybody. Exactly. Um, so, you know, I mean, so like my experience in high school is like I couldn't find others like me. So I ended up with the drama kids. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So that's interesting. You just end up going to a geekery of some sort. Right. Exactly. I mean, and you know, I, I should never give you pictures of my house because it, it is absolute <laughs> geekery because that's what I ended up gravitating towards is I was yeah. like, well, I don't belong anywhere. So I guess I'm going to go with the nerds. Um, yeah. Cause I get really excited if I see other, like, well, if I see people that look racially ambiguous in any way, shape or form, you know, the, the likelihood I'm going to see a black Japanese white kid on, the streets is you know pretty low but i see like a, a half let let you know like an afro latino or or uh oh, asian white person something like that i'm like hey i'm one of you too you know it's just right. a little thing but at the same time i see someone wearing a, a marvel t-shirt and i'm just like hey i'm a marvel girl or you know or right. it's a batman it's like batman's approved even though it's dc or you know like i i gr- tend to gravitate towards the thing the the shared star wars whatever you know that kind of right. stuff um and you kind of feel the same until some Something pops up like, well, you know, someone says there's not a lot of, you know, POC superheroes. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, these aren't really my people. They're just we just share this thing. This one. Yeah. You know, uh, right. That that is (laughs) that that is kind of a weird thing. But but I wonder if I wonder if monoracial kids feel this way. Do they have to let's let's say they don't quite fit in with the other kids that look just like them. Mm -hmm. Do they do they feel that sort of otherness the way that we feel it? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to directly answer to your question, but it did remind me of, of, you know, an experience I had in high school where, and I'm, I'm, I'm making assumptions here, but I'm sure you also know, like, the, the white kid who's obsessed with Japanese people. Yeah, otakus. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, My favorite. I just, yeah, I just, I remember, because I, I went to a huge high school, but I remember there were, like, three of us who were Japanese, and mm. two of us, I think, were half, and, uh, but because of that, those people always flocked to us, and we were like, we don't speak for all Japanese people. I know, you're just um, a representative <laughs> but like. Everything. <laughs> but I remember even as like a as like a teenager thinking this is so weird. Like, why do you want to be othered? Like, I, I don't mm-hmm. think I use the word othered in my sure. 15 year old brain. But right. I just remember thinking it was so odd because I was like, I always feel so awkward. And I always I, I don't feel comfortable. Why do you want to feel that way? Right. <laughs> so. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure where that comes from at all, but I mean, it, it must come because I mean, they're surrounded, may, you know, maybe it's the opposite problem and I'm just spitballing here, but maybe it's the, the opposite problem where everybody looks like me. So I got to find something different. I mean, sure. Yeah. I don't see why that couldn't be a part of it. The weird thing about when somebody does get a fascination with a, a culture that's different than theirs, um, you know, it's fine to be, to be interested and have that fascination, but it tends to go overboard with a lot of yeah. people. You know, like the otakus that just straight up, like, you know, they're walk- they're doing their hair like anime characters, and they're yep. you know, the, the worst is when they actually try to pronounce words like, you know, I don't know how many times <laughs> I had a, a, a white kid with, you know, a crazy anime hairstyle say hello to me and stuff like that. It's like, eh, you know, I, yeah. you can still be white. You just, you just like it. It's fine. Um, I, you know, I did a 
I went through a phase and I guess I still kind of am where I'm obsessed with like ancient Egypt. So I have a lot of ancient Egyptian stuff and Mm -hmm. I even have a tattoo that is that is that. But I never at any point of sitting there like trying to just convince people (laughs) that I'm like a part of this culture. It's just something that I have a fascination with. And like, why why can't I have a fascination about something and not try to insert myself in it, but just just like it? Um, The otakus get go a little far. I mean, it happens across a bunch of cultures. I see I see a lot of black kids right. and, and uh, Latinx kids that are into it too. But the weird thing is the the performance that they do versus just yeah. liking some stuff. Yeah, no, I, I think performance is a good word for that. It's <laughs> it's very bizarre, and I I don't understand. But and then it well it's, it gets you, it's a little scary because it can lead into fetishizing because then you know that that right. kid that's obsessed with it sees a Japanese person or a mixed Japanese person and they're like, oh my gosh, you're like that thing that I really like. And then yeah, they you know they click onto you and so you're now the expert of anything Japanese relation related yep or even worse don't know how to answer a question and get corrected by a white kid who <laughs> has studied the shit more than you and then you're just like I mean nothing will offend me faster than being corrected by like even though I don't speak fluent Japanese I speak a little um I watch anime but I don't watch all of the anime things like that but I say something or I can't answer a question and I get corrected by a white person or if my Japanese gets corrected by a white person I lose my mind <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, complete like like sidebar. But uh, I had a conversation with a, actually a student a few years ago who was sent to me from um, from the Asian American Club. Like I'm I'm not involved with the Asian American Club, but <laughs> apparently this student was really into learning Japanese. So the the advisor sent that kid to me, no. and um, and at one point, like, because I. I keep all sorts of toys in my room and like I collect weird stuff and um, but he pointed to this stuffed animal that a student had given me a few years ago and he says oh kawaii desune mm. and I, I was like oh god and and I tried to like very gently correct the pronunciation and he goes no it's spelled D-E-S-U it's Ew. desu and I was like no stop stop yeah it's an Americanized version of how to oh gosh I can't I have those stories too I can't deal with it <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, it was the um, being in a restaurant and I ordered skiaki and I was told that it was actually it's pronounced suki yaki. <laughs> and it was worse because of the accent that was added to it, like that California Valley, like, yeah, surfer accent. <laughs> and I just like I, I was ready to stand up and leave the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. like I was ready to do that. Oh gosh, yeah. other people do that stuff. So. Um, I appreciate those sidebars because everything yeah. on this stuff gets so heavy sometimes. Like when I said <laughs> when I set out to do this podcast, I really just wanted to talk about being mixed all the time because I talk about being mixed all the time, and mm-hmm. I don't know why. Like even though I know that I have a bunch of heavy stuff, I didn't expect like that most of the directions of these conversation would be leading in the heavy direction. And, and it's a weird thing. It's it's mostly just because like I thought we I thought we would be like commiserate and then with a couple of like white people are crazy because they do this you know that kind of stuff yeah um, but every now and then it gets really really dark and you're just like oh yeah this is actually why we're doing this because yeah we need to expose this you know uglier side of what it's like to have to walk around with a racially ambiguous face and 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 the like the entitlement that that non um, ambiguous people have to try to figure out what to do with you right. um, but on occasion it's just nice to be able to be to to say something like yeah don't correct my Japanese yeah <laughs> and even like, if I say something wrong don't correct it my, I say it the way my Japanese grandma says it so shut up yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that that you say it. So I've been listening to um, to all the the podcasts you've put out so far, hmm. and Thanks. even though I don't have the same mix as you or anyone you've had on the show yet, I've found like things that have been said have been resonating with me, mm-hmm. and and it is it's been fascinating to me that even though we don't have the same mix, we have similar experiences, right? Just by virtue of being mixed. Yeah, that's actually been the, a really great part of this. Um, another part of it that was a bit unexpected it was like I know that when I see another mixed race person I get excited just because I'm just like you're kind of like me and yeah you're at least more like me than these monoracial people are you know you'll at least know what it's like to walk into a space and someone be like I need to figure out what you are you know all of those kinds mm-hmm. of things kind of link us together but we don't tend to group together no. <laughs> because in, in just like a way monoracial people would do we need to find the ma- 
that matches that are like us, you know, and right. and because we go through our entire life having to fight to figure out first, we have to go through our identity crises of figuring out what we actually identify for. And yep. Some of us pick one over the other. Some of us flip. Some of us just be like, I'm going to live. I'm just going to live it all. And then at some point be like, oh, no, I need to code switch because I'm in this Japanese area right now. So I need to, you know, be this way or I need to be actually that happened to me at a grocery store uh, this week. I, I straight up went I, I went from being regular old Charmaine to code switch deference pain. You know, like I, I just like I hunched over. I, I started to speak with the way that clipped way that I speak when I talked to my grandma. I was re- just responding to a cashier at the at the Japanese grocery store and my husband was watching me do it. And then as soon as I finished paying, I walked out, I, I straightened back up and I went right back into my regular charmaine and he was cracking up because he mm-hmm. never he'd seen me do it with my grandma, but he never seen me do it with a stranger before. Um, and uh, th- this is this weird thing about like sometimes I'm just trying to be seen the way that I am. And sometimes I just really want someone to be able to identify that I'm Japanese. Right. Or or even just a, like, a, I'm going to say this word and I hate saying it this way, but even just let me be Japanese because I right. think something specific to what I don't have to deal with on the black side that I do have to deal with on the Japanese side. And you you may too, I don't know, is the not being Japanese enough um, yes. thing. <laughs> and so like even my grandmother, who is born in Japan, she married an American GI. And so she's actually been in the States way longer than she was ever in Japan. But I see her, I hear a Japanese woman, I see a Japanese woman, I think of her as Japanese. But when we meet other Japanese, they don't view her as Japanese anymore. Mm-hmm. So if my Japanese grandmother from Japan isn't Japanese, then how the hell am I going to be seen as Japanese with my little quarter walking around here going like, what that's right. You know, <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's such a it's it's such a weird, uh, weird thing. And, you know, and I'm I'm over here. I, I walk around like I'm Japanese and then I see Japanese people and I'm like, hi. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like I don't want to. I don't want the rejection. I guess of not being Japanese enough. Mm. Yeah, no. I mean, yeah. I, I I feel that a lot too. Is like you know, and I'm I'm very proud to be half Japanese. Mm-hmm. And then I show up at like you know, there's um there's a Japanese cultural center a couple of towns away that I take my kids to because I want them growing up with their culture too mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden i'm like yeah i i'm not japanese enough for a lot of these people and then i bring it and then my kids of course were born with blonde hair and blue eyes of all things <laughs> um you know, so my, my husband's wife so they're quarter japanese and of course they took every recessive trait ever right um and they're just looking at me like what are you doing <laughs> and i'm like i promise i'm japanese guys <laughs> <laughs> Why is this? Why is this Mexican lady bringing these white kids to the Japanese? Exactly. <laughs> oh. Yeah, uh, I actually. Oh God, it was. Um, it was on Children's Day on May fifth this past year, and I. Um, I took my kids there. Um, and I, I put them in. I thought they were super cute, like little yukata, like baby yukata. Wow. And um, and I walk in with a stroller, and this very well-meaning older Japanese gentleman asked me if I was the nanny and is their mother coming. Mm. And I was like, no, no, I, yeah. I'm their mom. <laughs> I'm their mom. I'm half Japanese. They're quarter Japanese. We belong here. Right. It's okay. It, oh, gosh, I don't know why this, this is a common thing that keeps popping up. It's one of the, like you said, it's one of those weird things that resonates across all of us. Everybody is somebody's nanny. Yep. I spoke. I spoke to a girl whose whose mother is um, a Moroccan, uh, sp- French speaking, black, and her father was white, and she is very light skin, and so people always thought her mom was her nanny, and they were like, "Why are you speaking French to your nanny?" You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> like, first of all, the fact that you would think that um, you would learn French just to communicate with a nanny is already pretty <laughs> impressive. But, but to actually call people out for this kind of stuff is, is ridiculous. That actually makes me afraid of what's going on in the in the world right now. Like, not to, not necessarily to turn this into a very political discussion, but when people, when a monoracial parent or even a mixed race parent that does not look like their children is walking around with their kids and they now get accosted by someone who thinks they're mal- well-meaning saying, I don't think that this is the parent of these children. And, yep. you know, like accusing people of kidnapping their kids because that happened to a guy in D.C. a couple of weeks back, I think, mm-hmm. or Virginia um, near D.C. where his kid looked white and he's black, but his kid was mixed and the, a white lady was calling the cops on him. And he's like, well, I, if I'm pushing a stroller, how do I prove that this is my child? Yeah. You know, we 
don't have licenses for the kids. We don't walk around with their birth certificates. Right. You know, we're just living our life. And now I have to sit there and try to figure out how to pr- how to prove this is my child. Do you have a DNA kit somewhere? Like what right. do we do in this current climate where we we should be able to accept the fact that people look different now. There are so many more mixed race people now than there was even at, especially at the time I was born. Um, yeah. You know, so like how are we not starting to get used to the fact that people look racially ambiguous and to get this way we had to be made by a couple of monoracial people that that got together right so we're well, not- even, <laughs> even in like the you know i was born in 1984 and i i remember walking around with my mom in like kmart and her being asked where me and my brother were adopted from oh because and that was that that was big during right, the 80s right i mean because my mom is you know blonde hair, green eyed. And then my brother and I are very ambiguous, but Mm -hmm. dark hair, dark eyes. Um, And then in the summer, very dark, like we both darken real quick. Um, So I mean, like, so she got asked that now I'm being asked, am I my kid's nanny? And it's just, it's, yeah, I mean, you're right. Like you'd think like 20, 30 years of this, we'd We'd get used to it. (laughs) Right. We'll see. But that's interesting because, and that's just an accident, right? Is you're, all you're, all you're doing is talking and you say that your white mother is being asked where she adopted you from but mm-hmm. you a poc is the nanny right to these white looking children which is another example of privilege that nobody's checking <laughs> yes and the, oh gosh see this is like uh, it just every time i start to see that clock look like it's getting close to an hour i'm like no because yeah. we just cracked <laughs> something else um yep. this is a part of privilege that is actually really frustrating because we as people of color have tons of examples of this of mm-hmm. where a white person is seen a completely different in the same scenario a white person is seen in completely different um, view from the, the person of color and they doing the exact same thing everything's the same but the skin color and right. here you are a nanny and she is an, an adoptee and there's other things that are ugly in that too is because in, in, in her case this is this wonderful benevolent thing she's done um, adopting these you know uh, other baby babies from other places and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and raising them as her own uh, and it's going to be such a, a a big deal like it's such a nice thing for a white woman to do this and she's just your mom <laughs> she's just right. she's, she's not she didn't do anything different than just get married and have babies right. um, but you are a worker in someone's view you right. could you, you couldn't possibly have ended up with a with a white person to have babies with or anything like that or that your kids couldn't be a throwback from an earlier generation that that is an ugly side of privilege that i i, I I mean, I'm not a sociologist, so I can't figure out why this kind of stuff comes up. I'm not a psychologist, so I don't understand what happens in the brain to make people think this way. But it is something that I want to figure out. I want to talk about and and expose because I think it it would probably shock a lot of white people to think that they have these natural biases. Like, they're not really aware sometimes of their natural biases. My husband's been catching it a lot lately, too. He's he's half Palestinian, half white, but he grew up only being white. He didn't know about the Arabic side until we were adults. So, Mm, and he is catching himself now with me. Like, well, we go to an event or, or uh, one example was we watched Get Out. And um, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but something at the end of the movie happens that all white people felt relief and all people of color were like, "Uh oh, and he felt relief. And I got stressed out. And so we had to have a conversation about it on the way Mm -hmm. home. Like, you know, I was like, you, you know, why are you saying, thank goodness (laughs) in this moment? And I'm going, oh my gosh. And, and so he's like, I didn't realize how much privilege I had. Like, and so now he's, he's becoming so much more aware of his privilege because this kind of stuff is happening quite a bit. And he was, so he's having to check that kind of stuff now. He's like, I didn't realize I was as white as I was. You know, he grew up around a military base full of people of all people of color. He, most of his friends were black and yet he still has these these privileges that he wasn't even aware of and now he's becoming so aware of it that he he's luckily he's turning it into a way to deal with other white people like no you need to check this because you didn't realize what you just did um, yeah you know luckily he turned out that way and i don't have to like get a divorce now because he yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Because no, I mean, it. my husband and I have had a lot of those conversations over the years, too. I mean, because he's like, you can't get much wider than, than my <laughs> husband. Um, but, you know, just just being out in public with me over the last decade or so, he's he's really started opening his eyes and really started figuring out what privilege means. And and even though our kids present as white, he's you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud of him that he's taken the time to be like, no, we have mixed kids and we need to talk about that. Okay. Um, so, does, yeah, I mean, I... Does oh, he ahead. immerse himself in, in sort of like when you do the Japanese cultural things with your kids? Does he get in himself involved as well? Yeah, no, he comes with us. Um, and it was funny. The first time I took him to one of those things, he came... He was completely silent on the car ride home. And I finally, I was like, are you okay? And he's like, I've never understood what it felt like to be the odd one out mm. and i was like yeah yeah how about that yeah let's talk about it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that that that's another thing too um kind of getting into because a lot of my japanese side of the family um through my grandmother and two of her sisters all married white men um actually they were friends um my grandfather and my two great uncles uh happened to be friends and married my grandmother and two of her sisters and i can see that in what little interaction I had with them when I was a kid, I I always saw that my white uncles were white and their wives were Asian wives, not mm -hmm. white. You know, like whether or not it was intentional or not, or wh whether or not it was the time period. Because mm -hmm. like when my grandmother came over, the military put her in wife classes, like Americanized wife classes, uh, mm -hmm. making her learn English and how to how to be an American wife. Um, you know, trying to remove the otherness, making them not teach their kids Japanese and so my, my mom doesn't speak Japanese and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, well, I think we talked about this last time that my dad doesn't speak Japanese either, but it's because my family was in the camps, mm -hmm. but you know, and, and they decided, well, we need to prove that we're American. Yeah, so we're going to stop speaking Japanese period. We have, you know, they have already thrown us in jail for looking the wrong way right. once. So we're not going to do anything that lets them do that again. Right. And that, that is actually yeah. something that's pretty prevalent in a lot of Japanese that are here, whether they are post internment or non internment, you know, came just just came after right. that 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 idea of assimilating into the culture and and just I mean it's funny it's because it's a part of our culture too to just sort of like be accommodating to whatever environment you're in, you know. Yeah. So like I I automatically know if I see a whole mess of little old Japanese ladies, I'm going to defer down to the you know I'm gonna I'm gonna hunch over when I talk to them and kind of speak at eye level. I'm gonna do whatever they tell me to do and blah 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 like so even just in our culture we're very accommodating and adjusting adapt you know adapting right. to the scenario so then we move to another country and we just be you know don't give them any reason to think of us as different whereas like i was always jealous of my chinese friend my korean friends my Thai, you know Hmong friends they all spoke their language right like we had our food and we had our festivals but we didn't have the language and it was like pulling teeth to even get a little bit of that um, yeah growing up and so as an adult i've made more efforts and i've gotten better but i'm not i'm not great you know um yeah I definitely understand more than I'm comfortable speaking. And, and I also mimic my grandma's accent. So I didn't know this until uh, I was at, I used to work at Dell and I had greeted some Japanese businessmen to take them into a meeting once. And I used my Japanese, you know, what little Japanese I could speak. And one of the guys asked me, why do you sound like an old lady? <laughs> and I was Aww. like, I don't know. And, and he goes, well, where did you learn Japanese? I, I said, well, my grandmother. And he goes, oh, you're using old lady talk. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, so, you know, even then, like, I'm, I'm not even using the appropriate Japanese when I'm when I'm yeah. attempting to, to to make myself be seen as a Japanese person yeah um, to other people uh, but yeah we're, we're getting close to to our hour but I want to talk to you again if you wouldn't mind to, to do this again because I think yeah I think no. so talking about the colorblindness and the privilege stuff I'd like to see how your program develops as you as you get further into your school year trying to work yeah. on that with your teachers that would be amazing yeah um, definitely because I, th I think what you're doing is probably a lot more important than your, even your school board will will realize until it, has, it starts. It has a lot of effect on these kids, and, and it'll probably have a big effect on you too. So I'd like to I'd like to hear more as as time goes on. Um, but I thank you so much for joining me. For th well, first of all, thank you for yeah. even responding to my posts. Um, you know, on the Japanese group, and I've had you know now a couple conversations with you that have mm -hmm. been really awesome. And just finally, I get to talk to another mixed Japanese. It's such a yeah. It's so hard for me. I, I actually live even close to yeah. Little Osaka here 
in in um, LA and I, I don't get very engaged <laughs> you know I besides going to eat um, you know <laughs> stuff like that yeah. I don't get to be around Japanese this very often so I appreciate that for you but yeah, before no, we go I'm, is there anything that you last last minute things you want to say or share um, I mean I just wanted to say thank you for doing this podcast because I I, I think this is a super important topic um, I'd be happy to come back on again and and talk with you some more and thank you hopefully hopefully my you know what we're doing at the school starts making a more an immediate impact um, I'm yeah I'm not really interested in the slow burn because I, I feel a sense of urgency with it I agree yeah uh, um, but yeah I mean, otherwise yeah thanks okay. for having me <laughs> great thank you so much Militantly Mix is a main hustle media podcast produced and hosted by me, Charmaine Johnson. Music is by David Bogan, The One. And if you like what you heard on Militantly Mix, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes and wherever you find your podcasts. Main Hustle Media. Turn your side hustle into your main hustle.